Well, good evening. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Um, we're going to continue our study reading from A.T. Jones, 1893 General Conference Bulletins. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, Lord, for the Sabbath and for the trials of this past week. We know, Lord, that you have a purpose for each one of us and that these trials that we face come from you, that they are part of your healing plan for us. We need you every moment of every day. And we need you now, Lord, as we open your word together, as we read the message that your messenger, A.T. Jones, had in 1893 that parallels what's happening today. We need to know what is true. We ask, Lord, that you can help each person to have a clear and understanding mind and that your Holy Spirit can work a, a work of confession and repentance in our, our lives. Be with us now. Be with this movement. May you guide and direct is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so one of the things we've noticed as, as we've gone through A.T. Jones' 1893 General Conference Bulletin's sermons, um, and, and just a very quick review, that Jones has laid out a situation that is occurring in his time where he believes that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down, that the Sunday law is, is, is closer than when they first believed, and that there is a work that needs to be done in preparation for this Sunday law. And it's that work that he sees that needs to be done that really has been the focus of our studies in, in all of the aspects of our studies, whether it's the morning studies, whether it's the Friday night and, and Sabbath afternoon studies or the Sabbath morning studies. And even for Heidi and I, what we've been reading in the Spirit of Prophecy and our personal devotions has pointed in the same direction. Amen. And that is simply, if we are going to um, have a Sunday law, we have to ha give a warning and we ourselves have to be ready. And it's quite clear that we are not prepared for what is to come upon the world. And we have not warned the world. And so that work that Jones is laying out, especially in these next two, that relate to uh, the message to the Laodiceans, uh, these are extremely powerful messages, something that we often think has to do with someone else. That is, the message of the Laodiceans, that's for somebody else. It's not for us. But the very fact that we think we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and know it's not that we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, shows that we actually are the ones in need of that message, that it is directly talking to us and not to someone else or just someone else. <clears throat> so again, you know, I was lamenting the fact that Jones is repetitious. Because, you know, we have to read Jones and then we have to comment on it and it takes a while to get through this. But I, I believe that Jones' way of presenting is a powerful way of presenting. It allows us to examine things in, in a way that's a little, it's closer than we would if we were just a given the outline. So he, he helps lead our minds to really consider things seriously. So anyway, we're going to begin reading here. <clears throat> Some have said that they cannot see how a man can acknowledge himself to be wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked and don't know it. And at the same time, be rejoicing in the Lord. Well, I would like to know how anyone else can. I would like to know how a man is going to rejoice in the Lord when he thinks he is all right himself. Can you tell? I can't imagine. But when a man knows that he is what the Lord says he is, 
and acknowledges that and then finds that the Lord is so good that he will take him just as he is and fit him to stand in the presence of God through all eternity, then that man has something to rejoice for. He can't do anything else. Why, brethren, the Lord does not save us because we are so good, but because he is so good. Do not forget that. He does not save us nor bless us in the work of God at all because we are so good, but because he is good and we are bad. And the blessedness of it is that he will bless us so much when we are so bad. And the rejoicing of the whole thing is that he saves us and makes us to reflect his own image as bad as we are. That is where the rejoicing comes in. Well, about understanding that, I cannot understand it, but I can know it is so, and that is all I care for. It will take eternity to explain it so that we can understand it. But as long as I know it is that it is so, I am not going to trouble myself and worry about how the Lord can do it or whether I can understand it. Are you? congregation says no. Now there's another point right here that we may bear in mind. Those who can't see that it is so. Brethren, you tell the Lord over and over that it is so, and then you will see it. You will not understand it then, but you will see it. You can't see how it can be, but you can see that it is a fact, and that is the only way you can. Can I see it as long as I keep myself from it? No. It is a thing that pertains to the heart, and you can't see it with your eyes. You must see it with your heart, and it is only the Spirit of God who gives the eye salve that you can see it. Here's something that will not explain it, but will perhaps help you to get the idea a little better. In testimony number 31, page 44, I read these words. Are you in Christ? Not if you do not acknowledge yourselves, erring, helpless, condemned sinners. That is what some of the brethren say they can't see. They say, I can't see how, if I am in Christ, I am to acknowledge myself a helpless, undone sinner. I thought, if I was in Christ, then I could thank the Lord. I was good, sinless, entirely perfect, sanctified, and all that. Why? No. He is. When you are in Christ, he is perfect, he is righteous, he is holy, and never errs, and his holiness is imputed to you, is given to you, his faithfulness, his perfection is mine, but I am not that. Now, we're going to see how Jones lays this out, but one of the things that has happened within Adventism, we have all heard of the in Christ motif, at least many of us have, right? And that's the idea that we are perfect in Christ, but we are still imperfect in our sins. And that is a distortion or an error that Jones is not teaching here. But often people will use Jones' words to present. They will take statements like this out of the context of everything Jones has said and say, well, we're in Christ. He's perfect. He's righteous. We're just sinners. And you know, it's just his perfection, not mine. But if we read everything Jones says, we will see that that's not what he's saying. It is Christ's righteousness, and it is imputed to us, but it is also imparted. If it was just imputed, we would have no fitness for heaven. So the right? difference between imputed and imparted is what? Well, if, if I'm remembering correctly how Ellen White says it, she says um, his imputed righteousness is our title for heaven and his imparted righteousness is our fitness for heaven. Is that correct? A am I quoting Spirit of Prophecy correctly? I, I'm not sure if I'm doing that. I correctly. believe so. That's how I remember it. I mean, that's how it makes sense to me. But um, I 
Okay, so she says, the righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is our title to heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. So, yeah, much the same with right. what you said. So she says, righteousness within is testified by righteousness without. He who is righteous within is not hard-hearted and unsympathetic. But day by day, he grows in the image of Christ, going on from strength to strength. He who is being sanctified by the truth will be self-controlled and will follow in the footsteps of Christ until grace is lost in glory. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is our title of heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. And that's from the Review and Herald, June 4th, 1895. So a couple of years after Joan's uh, presentation here. So... Uh, and Jones is not going to disagree there with the spirit of prophecy. But some like to talk about this imputed righteousness and, and uh, really ignore the imparted righteousness. Now, true, it is all Christ's righteousness. Whether it's imputed or whether it's imparted, it is not so, the, there's not one thread of human devising in the garment of, Christ, that, of Christ's righteousness with which we are clothed. Right. That we're responsible for it. It is all Christ's righteousness because man isn't righteous. But God does make us righteous in him, in Christ. But some people look at this in Christ thing as it's just Christ. You know, it's just his righteousness apart from us. That is, we don't actually change in character. So anyway, that's just an aside there. Um Perhaps you can get this thought a little more clearly by the word with which we are all familiar in 1 Corinthians 1.30. Who, Christ, of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Then where is my righteousness? In Christ. Where is my wisdom? In Christ. Where is my sanctification? In Christ. Where is my redemption? In Christ. Oh, yes, but when I come to him for wisdom and ask him for wisdom and he gives it to me, then can't I boast and say, I am wise? Why, no. Just the moment that I say that, I am a bigger fool than I ever was before in this world. Because by yielding to the Lord, he has deigned, however you say that word, deigned or dined, to stand by me and so give me his wisdom. That I may lead, that it may lead me and guide me in wisdom's ways, and that I should walk in the way that is right. His having done that, can I then pride myself upon it and say, Now I am wise? Don't you see in the nature of things that would be the biggest piece of foolishness that ever struck me? He did it, he helped me, he gave me his wisdom, he was my wisdom. When I did not walk wisely, he gave me his wisdom. His wisdom guided me. His wisdom took hold of my mind and heart and led me and kept me in wisdom's ways. Then he is my wisdom, and I have no wisdom at all but his wisdom. Don't you see? Now you just get it that way, and then you know that it is a fact. I will guide thee with mine eye. When he says he guides with his eye, I shall answer it is his it is his eye that guides you and me, and not our own eyes. Then the only thing to do is to just let ourselves go utterly, completely, and let ourselves be his utterly and completely, that he may be all and in all of us. Therefore, he is our wisdom, our sanctification, our redemption, and our righteousness. Then he is my sanctification where I am wretched. He is my comfort where I am miserable. He is my sight where I am blind. He is my riches where I am poor. And he is my knowledge where I do not know. And now about that thought last night. Some thought that I was going entirely too far. They could say, it is well enough when he says, you are wretched. I say, I am wretched. Then he says, you are poor. I say, I am poor. When he says, you are blind, I say, I am blind. And when he says, you don't know, then I am to say, I know it. No, no, 
When he says, you don't know it, I am to say, I don't know it. Do not go to putting constructions upon his way. When I say I am wretched and miserable, poor and blind and naked, and on top of it, he says that I don't know it, I say, Lord, I don't know it. That brings us right to the text we started with last night. If any man thinketh he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know it. I do not know yet as long as I have been acknowledging that thing yet. I know not how wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked I am. If he should show myself just as I am, just as certainly as we take that Laodicean message as he speaks it, we shall receive all he has in it. Then, brethren, that is what it is intended for. That is just what the Laodicean message is intended to do. Let it do its work in his own way. Look here. Let us notice this testimony in Volume 1, page 186 and 187. This is given in 1859. Now, just before we, we read this testimony here, um, the problem that, that we have as Seventh-day Adventists is that we see other people as the Laodiceans. But we know that if, if we don't see ourselves as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, if we don't really believe that we're in that situation, and we say, well, that applies to somebody else, we're actually, of course, showing that that is applying to us because we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We are human beings. We're fallen human beings. But yet we don't see ourselves that way. We compare ourselves with others and we think, well, I'm better than this brother. And at least I'm not like this person. You know, I pay my tithes. I fast twice a week and I'm not like this publican. Right. So we're, we're in that situation as a Pharisee. He doesn't know his condition. And it's also important for witnessing tool to admit that we can relate to other people. Often we think we need to be better because we're Christians or something. But often the best witnessing tool is to admit that you have human tendencies as well. Well, yeah, if you lift yourself up in trying to witness to people that you're just this most wonderful thing since sliced bread, um, you're not going to be very no, effective in it's witnessing. It's not going to help you at all. Because even if they believe it, that you're a wonderful person, um, it's not going to be something to encourage them. It'd be something to discourage them, exactly. especially if they see themselves as have some kind of conviction there's something wrong in their lives. So anyway, I just wanted that comment. Uh, regarding this. Now, also notice the page numbers. I mean, obviously, uh, there's lots of page numbers um, in, uh, in Ellen White's writings, but 186 and 187. Mm. Now, of course, we know that the number of days cardinally from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month is 186, and the ordinal count is 187. And, and so I just thought it was interesting to note here. So Ellen White says, um, and this is volume one of the testimonies, whether this is the same pagination that they have today, I don't know. Probably it's different, but this is the pagination that Jones had at that time. I was shown that the testimony to the Laodiceans applies to God's people at, at the present time. And the reason it has not accomplished a greater work is because of the hardness of their hearts. But God has given the message the message time to do its work the heart must be purified from sins which have so long shut out jesus this fearful message will do its work when it was first presented it led to close examination of heart um so when when we look at this this, this message, this close examination of heart. Um, what, what is being said by this statement? How, how are we applying this? What, what has this message been about? The message that this movement has been involved in? 
How would we characterize this message? The message of July 18th. Can we see how this applies? Warning. This message? Just a warning. Okay. Message. More than just a warning. <clears throat> It has a work. It is a work that needs to be accomplished, right? The, mes the message to the Laodiceans is a warning, but it is also about a work that needs to be done, a, a greater work that needs to be done. The heart must be purified from sins which have so long shut out Jesus. This is called a fearful message. Mm. When it was first presented, it led to a close examination of heart. But for many of us, this is not what is going on. That is what is going to do it at this time. Let it do its work then. But there has been an intervening time since it was first presented. I read further. Sins were confessed and the people of God were stirred everywhere. Nearly all believed that this message would end in the loud cry of the third angel. But as they failed to see the powerful work accomplished in a short time, many lost the effects of the message. Is that what's happening to this movement at the present time? It appears that way. Because we want to see this work accomplished in a short time. And I understand why we're tired of this world, right? Yep. But we need patience. Here's the patience of the saints. They gave it up, as this testimony that has not yet been published says. The sins of Israel must go beforehand, must go to judgment beforehand. Every sin must be confessed at the sanctuary. Then the work will move. It must be done now. The latter rain is coming on those that are pure. All then will receive it as formerly. None receive the latter rain, but those who do all they can. Christ will help us. All could be overcomers by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus. All heaven is interested in the work. Angels are interested. God can make them a host against their enemies. Ye give up too quick. Ye let go too soon that arm. The arm of God is mighty. Satan works in, a, in different ways to steal the mind off from God. Victory, victory. We must have it over every wrong. A solemn sinking into God. Get ready. Set thine house in order. But when it was first presented, Joan says, because it didn't do the work in a short time, they said the time hasn't come. And so they gave up and missed it. Again, I read from the testimony, volume one, page 186. I saw that this message would not accomplish its work in a few short months. It is designed to arouse the people of God to discover to them their backslidings and to lead to zealous repentance that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. As this message affected the heart, it led to deep humility before God Angels were sent in every direction to prepare unbelieving hearts for the truth. John says, that is where we are. While that message is preparing us for the loud cry, God is sending angels everywhere to prepare people for the truth. And when we go forth from this conference with this message as it is now, the people will hear it. <clears throat> Elma goes on, the cause of God began to rise and his people were acquainted with their position. If the counsel of the true witness had been fully heeded, God would not have wrought for his God would have wrought for his people in greater power. Yet the efforts made since the message has been given have been blessed of God, and many souls have been brought from error and darkness to rejoice in the truth. God will prove his people. But Jones goes on. The particular point I wanted to read is this. 
that it is to prepare us that we may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. Then what is it that fits us for the loud cry of the third angel? The Laodicean message. Now, brethren, that place where I was reading last night gives us the reason why it is so important that we should have this anointing of the eyes with eye salve just now. I had merely read the passage last night. I will read it again now for further use. If those who have had great light have not corresponding faith and obedience, they soon become leavened with the prevailing apostasy. Another spirit controls them. While they have been exalted to heaven in point of opportunities and privileges, they are in a worse condition that the most jealous advocate uh, in a worse condition should be then the most jealous advocates of error. There are many who have thus been preparing themselves for moral inefficiency in the great crisis. They're going to be morally inefficient. Have you been preparing yourself for moral inefficiency at this time? Have I been at that? Right. And that's really a question that we have to look at. What, what kind of preparation are we doing? What are, what are we doing? <clears throat> Ellen White goes on, they are wavering and undecided. Others who have not had so great light, who have never identified themselves with the truth, will, under the influence of the spirit, respond to the light when it shines upon them. Truth that has lost its power upon those who have long slighted its precious teaching appears beautiful and attractive to those who are ready to walk in the light. What we want to study just now is this point, so this is Jones, that many have been preparing themselves for moral inefficiency in this great crisis. We want to inquire what that moral inefficiency amounts to, what the danger is, and how we got into it, don't we? If I am in that place, then I, I don't want, don't, then don't I want to know what that means? that moral inefficiency, what the danger is that is involved and how I got into it. The difficulty is to get the people where they will see what they need. The Lord will take us out every time. He shows us the way. But the first thing we want is to understand the danger and then how we got into that. Let us study that. Let us go at it. And we want to go at it in the same spirit that we studied the lesson last night, for it is all one lesson. So he's going to read here from Special Testimonies, Danger in Adopting Worldly Policy in the Work of God, right? So and we've, we've looked at this idea of policy over principle, right, in some of our other studies. So Ellen White says, as far back as 1882, Testimonies of the deepest interest in the points of vital importance were presented to our people. Now, remember, yesterday morning, we were reading from a testimony from 1881, August 4th, 1881, if you remember. And that, and what was the, the, what was the significance of the timing of that letter? For those that were there. What was it about August 4th, 1881? Two days before uh, James White. Yeah, so it was two days before James White's passing. And, and it was written in the context of writing about the story of Gideon after his death and what happened with his death. And we can see the parallel between James White. But now when we look back at 1882, we can see that there is something that came into Adventism with the death of James White. And I would say that this has come and, and grown and become predominant in this movement after the retirement of Jeff. But let's, let's read what Ellen White has to say here. As far back as 1882, testimonies of the deepest interest on, on points of vital importance were presented to our people in regard to the work and the spirit that should characterize the workers. Because these warnings have been neglected, the same evils that they pointed out have been cherished by many. 
hindering the progress of the work and imperiling many souls. Those who are self-sufficient, who do not feel the necessity of constant prayer and watchfulness, will be ensnared. Through living faith and earnest prayer, the sentinels of God must become partakers of the divine nature, where they will be found professedly working for God, but in reality, giving their service to the prince of darkness. That's definitely not a position we want to be in. So Joan says, now that is the fearful position to be in. For a person to be thinking that he is working for God, and yet his whole service is for the enemy, who will be in that position? Those who have not earnest faith, who have not surrendered all and have not Christ. In other words, those who have not heeded the Laodicean message, because their eyes are not anointed with the heavenly eyes out, but their understanding will be blinded, and they will be ignorant of the wonderful specious devices of the enemy. John says, brethren, we are in the time and we shall be in it from this time to the end of the world when we may be brought at any hour or any day to a place where if we wait to reason, we are lost. We will take the wrong side just as certainly as we wait to reason, we will take the wrong side. We can discern it only by that heavenly eye salve by which ye shall know the truth. And as soon as the thing is suggested, you can see the way all before you. We will be in places where the cause of God will hang upon what you or I shall say. And advantages that the enemy may have over us will depend upon what you or I say. And in these times, which are all the time, if you and I do not see and have the heavenly spirit to give us the right word to say, we shall say the wrong word. And it will throw every one of our brethren on the defensive and every soul of us will be at a disadvantage because the enemy is getting to that place <coughs> where he is scrutinizing every position we take. The enemy is now watching every position we take for the sole purpose of perverting it and to put us at a disadvantage. And we have seen that. I mean, I've seen it in my own life. Things I have done, things I have said, have actually hindered the work of God and helped the work of the enemy. And that's because the enemy was watching and he was looking for every position that we take so that he could pervert it and, and when we're not ready, even if we think that what we did was right, we have to know that Satan has taken that and perverted it. He's been watching. We need Christ at every moment, in every interaction. <clears throat> you and I need something more than human wisdom or our own reason to know how to take the right position. We will be in places where the honor of the cause will depend upon us. Questions will be asked that you never heard in your life before, before a committee, legislature, or something of that kind, but also sometimes just in our Bible studies that we have together. In some place where God has called us and given us an opportunity to spread the light and truth, a question may be asked that you never heard in your life, and you will have to know at that instant what answer to make. You will not have time to think or reason about it. Questions will be asked, which if you take time and pause to reason about it, the probabilities are that the reasonableness of the thing would appear directly the opposite of what the Spirit of God would say about it, because his ways are not our ways. And this is the one thing that's the hardest for us to learn, is we trust in our own reasoning ability, in our ability to, in our pr pr pride, to think that we, we can say the right things and we can know what the right thing is. But we don't know what's in people's hearts. We hardly even know what's in our own hearts. So without the Spirit of God, we have no way of knowing what to say. And he says, and brethren, I'm not talking at random. Some of these things have actually been done. And today you and I are at a disadvantage. And there are burdens which have been put upon you and me 
that we shall have to bear because of this very blindness of some Seventh-day Adventists. That is where we are. And when our enemies get hold of these things, if unfortunately they shall, and bring them against you and me to compromise our position when we stand for the truth as it is in Christ, we shall simply have to repudiate the whole thing and declare that it is not the truth. Although it came from a Seventh-day Adventist, it is a fearful position in which to be placed. I do not want to place you there. I do not want you to place me there. Well, then, you and I both need the heavenly anointing that we may know what to say and what to do at a moment's notice. Anoint thine eyes that thou mayest see. Here on page seven is the word. Those who believe the truth must be as faithful sentinels on the watchtower, or Satan will suggest specious reasonings to them, and they will give utterance to opinions that will betray sacred, holy trusts. But what sacred, holy trusts have we? Is not the cause of God, the work of the third angel's message, is not that the only trust that we have? Then when you and I betray sacred, holy trusts, what are we betraying? We are betraying the third angel's message. We are betraying every brother that we have, putting him at a disadvantage, selling him into the hands of the enemy. I would like to know why you and I do not need to walk straight. A voice um, in the crowd, I guess. Isn't there a passage where it says the spirit of God will tell us what to say? Elder Jones says exactly. And that is the very point. This exhortation is that we should depend upon the spirit of God and be sure we have it. Not slight the teachings of the Spirit of God, nor the way of the Spirit of God. On page 13, in a, re a reference is made to Elijah. Does Elijah weaken before the king? Does he cringe and cower and resort to flattery in order to mollify the feelings of the enraged ruler? Israel has perverted her ways and forsaken the path of allegiance to God. And now shall the prophet, to preserve his life, betray sacred holy trusts? Does he prophesy smooth things? To please the king and obtain his favor? Will he evade the issue? Will he conceal from the king the true reason why the judgments of God are falling upon the land of Israel? What does that mean to us? Are not we in the time of Elijah? Are not we to be driven out as Elijah was? Is not fire to come down from heaven against the truth as it came down there for the truth of God? Are not we to be driven out and be protected by angels as was he? And to be translated, as was he, do we not stand as did he? Then do we not need to have the faith that he had? There's a very important word for us in this subject. In testimony number 32, page 139. <clears throat> Is Satan always thus to triumph? Oh, no. The light reflected from the cross of Calvary indicates that a greater work is to be done than our eyes have yet witnessed. The third angel flying in the midst of heaven and heralding the commandments of God in the testimony of Jesus represents our work. The message loses none of its force in the angel's outward flight, for John sees it increasing in strength and power until the whole earth is lighted with its glory. The course of God's commandment keeping people is onward, ever onward. The message of truth that we bear must go to nations, tongues, and peoples. Soon it will go with a loud voice, and the earth will be lighted with its glory. Now, <clears throat> I know I've been doing lots of reading here. There's not really anything new in what Jones is saying, is there? No, not really. Not really. But isn't it kind of more immediate when we look at our present situation than it's ever been? I mean, think about where, when Jones is saying this, right? What he's seen. How, how are we paralleling Jones? Because that message that was supposed to be accomplished at that time, failed. Now, I don't believe that our message is going to fail now. But can we at least learn from 
from what Joan's experience was? I think so. I think that's the whole point is mm -hmm. to learn from that experience so we can apply it to our experience mm -hmm. to either make the mistakes or not make the mistakes that were made in the past. Yeah. So Ellen White says, are we preparing for this great outpouring of the spirit of God? Human agencies are to be employed in this work. Zeal and energy must be intensified. Talents that are rushing from inaction must be pressed into service. Talents that are rushing from inaction, right? So these are talents that are going to be used. They're going to be pressed into service. The voice that would say, wait, do not allow yourself to have burdens imposed upon you, is the voice of the cowardly spies. We want Caleb's now who will press to the front, chieftains in Israel, who with courageous words will make a strong report in favor of immediate action. Who went into the land of Canaan? Audience, Caleb and Joshua. The men who said they could go in, and because God was with them, they went into the land when all the rest fell in the wilderness. They went with their perishing brethren as they wandered because of their unbelief all the 38 years. But God had promised, you shall go in. Who will go into the land now? Has not the testimony been read to us that as Israel was on the borders of Canaan, so are we who shall go in? Those who make a strong report in favor of immediate action, they will go in. God says so. It may be that the doubting, fearful ones will linger <clears throat> and the cause and cause the cause of God to linger. But do not be afraid. God has promised that we shall go in. The Caleb's shall go in. That is settled. <clears throat> Ellen White goes on. When the selfish, ease-loving, panic-stricken people, fearing tall giants and inaccessible walls, clamor for retreat, that the voice of the Caleb's be heard. Even though the cowardly ones stand with stones in their hands, ready to beat them down for their testimony. Jones goes on, what are we here for? We have had in our lessons hitherto that we are not to be afraid of all the powers in this world, and the powers of the enemies that will stand against us and against the cause of God. We have seen that in the lessons here. Now this brings us us to the point where we are to stand faithful to the message of God and not be afraid of cowardly Adventists even. That is where God wants us to stand. He wants us to know what the message is now, right? And does this movement know what the message is now? Do we know? I, I, I don't, I don't, we may know it, but I don't think we know it. And are we even giving the message? No. He wants us to give the message as it is now. And if there are those who would beat you down with stones and clubs in their hands and revile you or anything of the kind, thank God that now is the time for immediate action. Another word or two from this special testimony, page six. I was shown that the follies of Israel in the days of Samuel will be repeated among the people of God today. Unless there is a greater humility, less confidence in self, and more trust in the Lord God of Israel, the ruler of the people. Now, one of the problems that happened um, with Adventism after the death of Ellen White, of course. So this is, uh, you know, some time before that, because we're going to get to the 1919 Bible Conference uh, in these studies and what happens there. But we know that. In this time here, in the second generation, beginning in 1888, there was an opportunity being presented to complete the work. We had the Great Controversy in 1884 published, and then in 1888, uh, the one that was for the public. So it's basically, uh, Ellen White wrote the 1888 Great Controversy so that it's something that we could share. And, and it was clearly marking out the Sunday Law the issues that were around this, this point. And yet that, that movement, Adventism, that movement that was started with Jones and Wagner's mes message is going to stall <clears throat> and fail. And then what's going to happen is you're going to have 
um, people that are trusting in self. And that happened obviously in that, that generation too. But we see this continue to grow, this rebellion, this apostasy. Because what was what was the result of the so-called higher education that the church uh, sought, especially after 1919? Does that do anything to bring about humility? Not that I could tell. I mean, I've seen it happen with many, many people, friends of mine. Once they receive this education, once they are put into that position as pastor, and not all, but many, they become more and more confident in self. They're less humble, more proud, less teachable. And now that does not mean that it only occurs in the educated. It occurs in all of us in different ways. We think we know things when we have no real true knowledge of God because we and we demonstrate that we don't know God because we don't keep his commandments. He that says, I know God and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And that would characterize us. So anyway, he says in the same chapter, I read again, they must be hewed by the prophets with reproof, warning, admonition, and advice that they may be fashioned after the divine pattern. On page four, I read again, the world is not to be our criterion. Let the Lord work. Let the Lord's voice be heard. Those employed in any department of the work whereby the word may, world may be transformed must not enter into alliance with those who know not the truth. The world know not the Father or the Son, and they have no spiritual discernment as to the character of, of our work, as to what we shall do or shall not do. We must obey the orders that come from above. We are not to hear the counsel or follow the plans suggested by unbelievers. Has that happened within Adventism? Yes. And, and, and definitely. Yes, to that is all, that, that's all very clear to us. We can see how uh, the celebration movement and so forth was listening to the plans suggested by unbelievers, as well as spiritual formation as well as, uh, um, I, I can't remember the name of it, uh, that uh, neurolinguistic programming and so forth, these types of things. But what about in this movement? Where, where has the enemy brought in plans suggested by unbelievers? Repeat that question. Where in this movement do we see counsel? Where hear counsel or follow follow plans suggested by unbelievers? Where where is the weakness in this movement? Uh, present day. Yeah, this movement right now. Where where is where is the enemy coming in? Where is the the greatest amount of anger? When, when this is ever suggested, what two points? Would it not be conspiracy theories and mm -hmm. false ideas of health? A false health message? Which are dividing us, yes. Right. So conspiracy theories, these are, this, this comes from the world. It doesn't come from the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. And these have infected this movement as well the spurious health, health messages that go contrary to the spirit of prophecy, that pick and choose uh, some things that might align with the spirit of prophecy, but mix it with error. That we, we use as our, our sources the messages of infidels, people who are not converted, who are not Seventh-day Adventists. We point people to their videos we point them to their web pages and we think that we are somehow following god suggestions made by these who know not the work of god 
the work that God is doing for this time will be such as to weaken the power of the instrumentalities of God. By accepting such suggestions, the counsel of Christ is set at naught. And, and if we think about the counsel of Christ as the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans, one of the things that these false messages do is they create in us a self-sufficiency, this idea that we are better than others. It's not a convicting message. It is a message that is the opposite of conviction. It makes us bold in our sins, in our condemnation of our brethren. It makes us think that we are better than others. <clears throat> what is that warning for? Is there any danger of our following worldly ways? If there were no danger, God would not have told us that there is. Is there any danger of our allying ourselves with or taking up a pattern of worldly organization and gets himself or herself at the head of it? And then because they have a little show of success, because temperance or morality or something of that kind, we think we have to copy after them and take up their plans. God is, has something better than that. He wants us to listen to the plans that come from above. He has told us long ago that although some of these organizations might have things that were in themselves good enough, temperance he has mentioned is one of them, but as long as they are allied to the mark of the beast, Sunday institutions, working for that, and for laws to compel people and to force, force the conscience, we cannot join with them. We can also see here that, that this is something that is very subtle. Remember, Jones has talked about the, the idea of, of protesting, but that time is past, that we don't need to do um, petitions, petitioning the government. We know that we have a sympathy with the world. We sympathize with them politically, with those that sympathize with us in the sense of we're conservatives. And, and we watch their videos and we pick up on everything that they're saying and we get caught up in that. But these people are allied to the mark of the beast, are they not? Mm -hmm. Even if they profess to talk about freedom, they don't understand what they're speaking of. <clears throat> so they, um, we cannot join with them, Jones says. That testimony has been there all these eight years that I know of, nine years now nearly. What the Lord wants is us. And the question now is at this time, shall he have us? Shall he have us to use us? Shall we be fully submissive to his will and listen for orders from above and obey those orders? There is a word on this point in volume one of the testimonies, page 183, speaking of the cause when the loud cry begins. All seem to have a deep sense of their unworthiness and manifested entire submission to the will of God. On page two of the testimony, danger of adopting worldly policy in the work of God, I read these words. I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. He who wept over impenitent Israel, noting their ignorance of God and of Christ the Redeemer, looked upon the heart of the work at Battle Creek. The brethren, we are in Battle Creek now, and this means us. This same Redeemer is now looking upon us. And we, of course, can say that what's happening then is speaking about us, is it not? Yes. Right. This same Redeemer is now speaking about us presently, not just Jones' time, but in our time. And we've seen the parallels. Great peril was about the people, but some knew it not. Unbelief. And impenitence blinded their eyes, and they trusted to human wisdom 
in the guidance of the most important interests of the cause of God. And from the testimony entitled to Brethren in Responsible Positions, page 10, I read these words. The original apostasy began in a disbelief and denial of the truth. We are to fix the eye of faith steadfastly upon Jesus. When the days come, as they surely will, in which the law of God is made void, the zeal of the true and loyal should rise with the emergency and should be the more warm and decided, and their testimony should be the more positive and unflinching. So there is the true and loyal in the midst of this apostasy. He goes on in page 12. There are those who have prided themselves on their great caution in receiving new light, as they term it. But they are blinded by the enemy and cannot discern the works and ways of God. Light, precious light, comes from heaven, and they array themselves against it. What next? These very ones will accept messages that God has not sent, and thus will become even dangerous to the cause of God because they set up false standards. And again, they need the heavenly anointing that they may comprehend what is light and truth. That means you and me. That means me especially. I tell you, a good thing to do if you have not done it yet is to read the first page, the first page article in the review of February 7th. It speaks quite fully on this subject. I will read a few sentences. To place ourselves in a position where we have an appearance of yielding is a new position for this people. It is a new experience, a departure from the principles to which we have adhered, which have made us what we are today, a people whom God has prospered, a people whom, who the Lord of hosts, who have the Lord of hosts with them. You who have a connection with sacred things, God bids you to be careful where you put your feet. He holds you accountable for the light of truth, that it shall shine forth in clear and distinct rays to the world. The world will never help you by its devices to let your light shine. Now here, Ellen White is talking about something quite a while ago, but we can see that this really describes the church in the, eight, in the 1950s, right? What does she mean by their yielding? They have an appearance of yielding. What, it, what was the church doing? We talked about this in our morning studies, the condition of Adventists, the problem that we have. They, they chose to go further into darkness by yielding up their understanding of what God had showed them and the doctrines we were to hold. Right. And, and so this spirit was already existing at this time in this second generation of Adventism. And, and the idea was that they somehow are going to win the world and, and also seek the help of the world. The world will never help you by its devices to let your light shine. The messages that come from outside of God's word are never going to be a help. They are only going to be a hindrance. All who hold the truth should hold it in righteousness and appreciate its value and sacredness. We need divine wisdom and skill that we may improve every opportunity um, that the providence of God shall prepare for the presentation of truth. So it's in God's providences that we have that opportunity to prepare or, or that we can, pre God, the providence of God prepares us for the presentation of truth. So Joan says, improve the opportunity, not betray it, nor fail when the opportunity is offered you. You are not prepared. What are we here for if we are not prepared? What are you and I as ministers, as Seventh-day Adventist ministers, ministers to carry the third angel's message, what are we here for if we are not prepared when God calls us and, give, and, and gives, gives us an opportunity? Let not the fear of men, this is Ellen White, the desire for patronage be allowed to obscure a ray of heaven's light. Should the sentinels of truth now fail to sound the warning, 
they would be unworthy of their position as light bearers to the world. But should the standard fall from their hands, the Lord would raise up others who would be faithful and loyal. It will require, require moral courage to do God's work unflinchingly. Those who do this can have no place to self-love, to selfish considerations, ambition, love of ease, or desire to shun the cross. Some may not apparently engage in the conflict on either side. They may not appear to take sides against the truth, but they will not come out boldly for Christ through fear of losing property or suffering reproach. All such are numbered with the enemies of Christ. I mean, we know that we have to lose all. Jones has made that clear. The Bible's made it clear. But for some, we take the, our positions because we, we have worldly considerations. The time has come when Christ's friends should be known. And if it is a Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist that is called into question, this is Jones, of course, for his standing in Christ and the message, let your friendship in Christ be known by standing by him. Now we have a few minutes to talk upon how we got into this position, how these dangers came upon us. You remember the other evening when I was reading that second chapter of Joel, Joel or Joel, that one of the brethren, when I had read that 23rd verse, Brother Corliss called attention to the margin. Do you remember that? And I said we would have to use for the margin at another time. Now, all of you turn and read the margin. The 23rd verse says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former reign moderately. And what is the margin? A teacher of righteousness. He hath given you a teacher of righteousness. How? According to righteousness. And he will cause... And it, he will cause to come down for you the rain. Then what will that be? When he, he gave the former rain, what was it? A teacher of righteousness. And when he gives the latter rain, what will it be? A teacher of righteousness. How? According to righteousness. Then is not that just what the testimony has told us in that article that has been read to you several times? The loud cry of the third angel. The latter rain has already begun in the message of the righteousness of Christ. Is that what Joel told us long ago? Has not our eye been held that we did not see? Did not we need the anointing, brethren? Uh, anointing, brethren, what in the world do we need so much as that? How glad we ought to be that God sent his own spirit in the prophets to show us when we did not see how infinitely glad we ought to be for that. Well, then, the latter rain, the loud cry, according to the testimony and according to the scripture, is the teaching of righteousness and according to righteousness, too. Now, brethren, when did that message of the righteousness Christ of Christ begin with us as a people? One or two in the audience, three or four years ago. Which was it? Three or four. Congregation four. Yes, four. Where was it? Congregation Minneapolis. And what then did the brethren reject at Minneapolis, some in the congregation? The loud cry. And what is that message of righteousness? The testimony has told us what it is. The loud cry, the latter rain. Then what did the brethren in that fearful position in which they stood reject at Minneapolis? They rejected the latter rain, the loud cry of the third angel's message. Brethren, isn't it too bad? Of course, the brethren did not know what they were doing, that they were doing this. But the spirit of the Lord was there to tell them they were doing it, was it not? But when they were rejecting the loud cry, the teacher teaching of righteousness, and, and then the spirit of the Lord by his prophet stood there and told us what, what they were doing. What then? Oh, then they simply set this prophet aside with all the rest. That was the next thing, brethren. It is time to think of these things. It is time to think soberly, to think carefully. So Jones has really laid out here, and, and we're going to study this history in more detail of what happened in 1888. But Ellen White stood and sided with the message that was given by God through Jones and Wagner. But what did they do? What did the leadership do? What did many people do 
when Ellen White sided with Jones and Wagner. They set Ellen White aside. They abandoned the spirit of prophecy. Yes, with all the other things that they had rejected. They couldn't have accept, rejected Jones and Wagner's message and accepted the spirit of prophecy because it was the same message, was it not? It was just presented in clear and shining rays. And yet it was rejected. Christ was cruci crucified afresh. <clears throat> uh, Jones is going to read uh, more from the Spirit of Prophecy, page 8, Danger of Adopting Worldly Policy in the Work of God. As man's intercessor and advocate, Jesus will lead all who will be, will be who all who are willing to be led, saying, follow me upward step by step where the clear light of the Son of Righteousness shines. But not all are following the light. Some are moving away from the safe path, which at every step is a path of humility. God has committed to his servants a message for this time, but this message does not in every particular coincide with the ideas of all, all the leading men. And some criticize the message and the messengers. They dare even reject the words of reproof. They dare even reject the words of reproof sent to them from God through his Holy Spirit. Now, if we think about this situation there, remember, we have uh, brother... Um, uh, it starts with the C and, and brother uh, Strickland. So brother Canwell and brother Strickland who are in Australia who are presenting a message that basically the Adventist church is Babylon. And, and are they wrong in what they see in the church? Is the church in bad shape? Yes. Okay. But are they any better off than the church? No. And why not? They don't see their own issues and their own failings. So we don't see our own problems. We, we are no different than the church. And this movement is in that position. We see the faults that, that exist within the church. And yet we do the same things. And in some ways we're worse. I mean, we saw how the church persecuted people in this message. And yet we, we are more ready to persecute. We are more ready to censure, to disfellowship than the church was with us. Correct? Agreed. And so we've rejected the work of the Holy Spirit, and yet we profess to believe this message. Now, the only remedy is going to be confession and repentance. We have to accept the Laodicean message. So Jones go goes on, you know who it, it was. I do not mean for you to look at, to somebody else. You know whether you yourself were at it or not. And brethren, the time has come to take up tonight what we there rejected. Not a soul of us has ever been able to dream yet the wonderful blessing that God has had for us at Minneapolis in which we would have been enjoying these four years if hearts had been ready to receive the message which God sent. We would have been four years ahead. We would have been in the midst of the wonders of the loud cry itself Tonight, did not the spirit of prophecy tell us there at that time that the blessing was hanging over our heads? Well, brethren, you know, each one for himself. We are not to begin to examine one another. Let us examine ourselves. Each one for himself knows what part he had in that thing. And the time has come to root up the whole business. Brethren, the time has come to root up the whole thing. I will read another passage upon that presently. Again, I read, 
What reserve power has the Lord with which to reach those who have cast aside his warnings and reproofs and have accredited the testimonies of the Spirit of God to no higher source than human wisdom? Now, <clears throat> when, when we look at the message of July 18th, were there people who were accrediting to the message of July 18th, no higher source than human wisdom? Could human wisdom have constructed those lines? No. No, it wasn't human wisdom. That we were able to see them was because of the work of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts. Right? No mind, no matter how brilliant, could have constructed those lines. It doesn't mean, though, that it didn't take work to see what God had constructed. But God had to show us those lines. Did he not just give us the lines? Did he give um, William Miller? The years um, 677, 457, and 508? Or were they just something, the product of his intellect? They, according to Spirit of Prophecy, they were the links in a golden chain. Yeah, these were the, these were the, 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 the um, uh, what, I can't remember the phrase. It was, the, it had to do with the chains of truth, but I can't remember. Is it the links? Is that the word? Yes. Okay, it's the word links. I was thinking there was some other word. But anyway, these were given William Miller. Was, were the lines constructed by Jeff, or were they given him by the Spirit of God? They were given by the Spirit of God. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that Jeff didn't have to study and to pray and to seek God. But if God had not given him the lines, he would not have them, no matter how, how much he studied and prayed. God had to choose Jeff, right? It wasn't Jeff's intellect that created Correct. those lines. Because Jeff didn't even fully understand where those lines were going to lead. When I first started studying chronology and I started to find these structures, that wasn't human wisdom, was it? Wasn't that the Spirit of God? Yes. But people have rejected a message that has come from the Spirit of God. They have said, that it was just the product of man's wisdom. People act as if July 18th is just a product of my intellect. And they have even said, you need to, we don't want to deal with this. It's too complicated. As if I am the one who constructed it. The wheels within wheels that Ezekiel saw, they were complicated, were they not? Yes. But didn't they have perfect order? Again, yes. Only when they were examined. At first sight, they appeared complicated. But as they were examined, the perfect order could be seen. Many people do not know the perfect order that God has unfolded to this movement. They do not appreciate it. They think it the source of human wisdom. But it is actually God's hand, God's spirit that is in the wheels. Is it not? Agreed. Now, earlier in this in this document, yeah. there had been a quote that you had attributed to, to Sister White. And it wasn't Sister White. It was someone else, wasn't it? No, it, it was Sister White. Oh, it was Sister White? Okay. There was a quote there that I was uncertain about. Anyway, yeah. Now, in the, in the same document, yeah. written eight years before Jones had given this sermon. So 1881 you're talking about? Or 1880? No, the, 
no, eight years because Jones was giving this in 1893. Okay, yeah, so 1890, 1885 then. Correct. Okay. So this was being this other document was being written after the doc the um, publishment by the president of the conference about how so much of the Bible was not inspired and after the close of the open visions because of Uriah Smith's comments. Yeah, so you're talking about Butler, G.I. Butler's? Yes, I am. Okay, his presentations about what is inspired and what isn't in the Bible. Correct. Okay. Now, now with, what you, with, with what you had just said, Mrs. White writes, wrote the following. While the doubting ones talk of impossibilities, while they tremble at the thought of high walls and strong giants, mm -hmm. let the faithful Caleb's who have another spirit come to the front. The truth of God, which bringeth salvation, will go forth to the people if ministers and professed believers will not hedge up its way as did the unfaithful spies. Yes. Our work is aggressive. Something must be done to warn the world and let no voice be heard that will encourage selfish interests to the neglect of missionary fields. We must engage in the work with heart and soul and voice. Both mental and physical powers must be aroused. All heaven is interested in our work and angels of God are ashamed of our weak efforts. There's no doubt about that. So a lot of, a lot of, did we read that earlier today? Did I don't we? know. Is, I, I mean, I read that just recently. I'm trying to remember when I read that. Was it part of what we read? I don't think so because I've I've never looked at this one before. Hmm. I wonder when I read this. Um, hmm. It's just kind of odd because I just read this, but I don't know when. I think it was a few passages up. It was earlier that we read this? Something similar. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, one thing that I noticed when, I, when we started going through this, and, and, and I want to apologize a little bit, but I actually think it was in God's providence. We actually started reading his ninth presentation, we haven't read his eighth presentation yet. I don't know if anybody noticed that. So, because he, he's referring us back to things that were in his, his eighth presentation. Now, um, so I'm just going to search here. Uh, yeah, I think we might have read that, but anyway. Um, so this is, um, yeah, so this is what we just read, what you just read, right? Yeah, so we had read this already about immediate action. Um, now, I just want to point us back here. So, so we read number nine. And um, almost done it, but um, so there's where we started. But actually, I meant to read read number eight, and we didn't read that. And um, I want to go back here. So this is where we actually should have started today. So we're going to read this next Friday. We're going to go back and read number eight. But just to close, I want to read a paragraph here. Uh, from from number eight so so we'll go back and read this so is i think it's in god's providence though that we ended up reading what we did um 
Let me see. I think it's on the fourth page here. Um, so uh, I want to read this um, paragraph. Um, that's not it. Uh, here it is. Yeah, this is the paragraph I wanted to read. So I apologize for that. Okay. Um, so this is um, um, talking about the ministry of Peter, the conversion of Saul, etc. Um, this testimony in regard to the establishment of the Christian church is given us not only as an important portion of sacred history, but also as a lesson. All who profess the name of Christ should be waiting watching and praying with one heart all differences should be put away and unity and tender love for one another pervade the whole then our pray prayers may go up together to our heavenly father with strong earnest faith then we may wait with patience and hope for the fulfillment of the promise and this is where we're going to come to next friday we're going to go through this section uh, so we're not doing this in order which um uh, um, but I think it was important for us to read that section today. But what we really want to look at and what we're going to see as we start to uh, finish off this section from the 1890, which is going to take us a while to do, but when we get through the 1893 General Conference Bulletin. Jones has laid out for us our history And this is the history of the establishment of the Christian church, because is that not the pattern? Yes. And when we talk about waiting and watching and praying with one heart, the only way that this happens is when all differences should be put away. And unity and tender love for one another pervade the whole. If we're going to accomplish what God has given us to do, we need to recognize how it is to be done. And only then will our prayers really be heard. And only then uh, we can truly wait with patience and hope for the fulfillment of the promise. So... I'm sorry about that, that I got the, the two mixed up. I, I knew actually once I had started reading about a page or so that I had missed on, that I, I was not on the right uh, reading, but I felt compelled to continue reading on. And um, <clears throat> so anyway, there's a lot for us to consider. And I'm sure that the message that Dwight will give tomorrow will fill in some of this that we've read here. Any any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for your instruction from the spirit of prophecy for the teacher of righteousness, Christ, who teaches us according to righteousness. We are thankful, Lord, for the message to the Laodicean church, for the work that needs to be done upon our hearts. We know, Lord, that we have failed to do the work that you have given us to do, and we repent. We ask, Lord, that you can forgive us for the way that we have hindered your work, that our rash words and actions have done more to create division and to discourage others. We just pray, Lord, that you can use us in spite of our sins uh, to reach those in darkness. Be with each person on this Sabbath. Bless the meeting tomorrow. And um, may your angels watch over each one. 
Bring us together again to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name.